Thanks for coming along to the presentation today. I'm going to talk about radical data, which I see as an emerging, emerging movement in data, art, and activism. My name is Joe Cruiser. I'm the founder of Radical Data, and where I also work as a data scientist. My day job is as a statistical consultant, mainly consulting for NGOs and social enterprises and governments. But more recently, I've put a lot of time into radical data, which is what I want to talk to you about today. I'm going to take about 25 minutes talking through this, and then I'm hoping we can have 10 minutes discussing what a radical take on data for good means. What's a critical look at some of the practices that are common in this area? But first, I want to start by the way that data is in our world right now. So we all heard about the data revolution. We promised something a little bit like this. I hope you like my green screen, by the way. I'm enjoying it. And I imagine we all imagined ourselves with this family a bit like this, with our beautiful children by our sides. All very, you know, genetically engineered to be beautiful, looking out across a smart city that you call home with perfectly timed public transport, beautifully managed. Uh, waste management systems and everything is going pretty well. You've got a wristwatch that tells you exactly how you're feeling at that moment. Your health is amazing. Actually, probably going to live forever and life's pretty easy. You're on a 10 hour work week, probably universal basic income, probably paid for by NFTs or crypto or something like that. And I don't know about you, but actually my hometown doesn't look quite like this at the moment. Instead, the way that data has come into our lives is something a bit more like how Mark Fisher described a boring dystopia, something that's quietly degrading, but nothing much to write a book about, just a little bit horrible. We have, when going to work in the morning, we can be surveilled as we do that. We can buy our croissant with our credit cards and the credit card company, they'll happily bundle that with some demographic data and sell off to some marketers who will happily have that and use that to sell you some more things. If you're a bit richer, you can uh, do some high frequency trading, which is pretty nice because you don't really even have to invest in real things. You just ride the waves of finance as it goes up and down on microseconds. It's quite neat. And then when you come back home from that, you might want to use that money to buy a dress or some shoes and that website that you go to has been optimized for your eyes to move as quickly as possible down to the buy now button. And that's on the good days, right? On the bad days, data science has been complicit in some pretty terrible things. We've got over here a police the way that police use data. They're using arrest data to look at who's arrested so that they can find out who's, who they should be surveilling more, who they should be arresting more of. So they look at their data and they go, ah, yes, people arrested more tend to be poor. Okay. Tend to be people of color. Okay. Tend to be inner city. Okay. So we should send more police to poor neighborhoods of people of color in the inner city. Okay, but then what happens? They arrest more people who fit this data and the model says, okay, we should arrest even more of them and we enter a feedback loop. So the, data, the police are using data in, it's, data is complicit in racialized policing in a very major way. It's also been complicit in racial violence in Ethiopia a year or two ago, it emerged that Facebook knowingly had been promoting certain posts that encouraged violence in the civil war in Ethiopia. And same in Myanmar a few years before that, which isn't a great sign that they didn't do anything the first time. So, where's our utopia, right? We were promised this beautiful thing. Remember our family on that hill, it looked really pretty nice. And 
we ended up with racialized policing and more shoes. So what happened? We promised this data revolution was going to go to us. The tools would be spread between citizens and artists and activists and communities. Instead, those tools stayed with the state. They stayed with corporations who used it to entrench their power. Just like in the 20th century, it just repeated itself. These tools weren't spread to equalize power. They just repeated it. It was a betrayal of a kind. We were told it was going to be liberating, and it wasn't. So what do we do after betrayal? I don't know about you, but I would be tempted to Google it. How can we trust big tech? How can we trust states again after betrayal? And so if you type in trust after betrayal, the first thing that comes up for me is helpline.com, 10 ways to rebuild trust in a relationship. So if we imagine that we, the citizens, have been betrayed by big tech and states over the data revolution, how should we go about fixing it? An advice for big tech, how to rebuild trust when you've hurt someone, you should consider why you did it. As we saw with Facebook, first encouraged racial violence in Myanmar, I don't think they really sat down and considered why they did it, because then, a few years later, they did it again. Now, interactive part. Apologize sincerely. Have you ever heard Mark Zuckerberg talk and found it sincere? No, me neither. Much less so when he's apologizing, right? I don't feel like he's ever meaningfully apologized for anything Facebook have done. And finally, the advice to Facebook is let the citizens need guide you. And it's a beautiful idea, actually. Can you imagine a Facebook where it uses all this money, all this investment, and all this amazing brain power? Can you imagine these mathematicians, computer scientists, psychologists, marketing professionals? Instead of building whatever this is that they're building, they decide to build communities, they decide to create, make it easier for you to go to physical events, to meet new people. It would be quite beautiful if something the size of Facebook turned all of this power towards citizens' needs. But judging by what they do, like the metaverse, that doesn't really seem like it's totally in line with what our needs are, the most urgent needs. So after this, the advice is, if you see the betrayer not following this advice at all, and actually doing the complete opposite, the betrayed have to know when to walk away. So that's what I did, and we are starting to do, starting to imagine building an alternative use of data, using data instead of building capitalist systems which push advertising and buying, how can we use data to, as a tool of joy and a tool of justice? So I started looking around, seeing what else was out there, seeing who else was thinking the same thing. And I started to find a lot more projects than I expected. I found data being used in resistance. This is a photo of some protesters in Hong Kong. They were being surveilled incredibly hard by the Chinese authorities who had very expensive, impressive technology, great AI and computer vision that must have cost millions of dollars. And protesters realized they could use these lasers and shine it at the camera and destroy the lens. And I loved that this massive state power and these millions of pounds was just being destroyed by these little lasers that burned the lens. I saw data being used as a tool of community. Querying the map is a project by my friend Lucas La Rochelle, and I think it's one of the most beautiful visions of what data can be. It imagines a map of the whole world, and it doesn't just imagine it, it creates it, where anyone, 
any queer person can put in memories that they've had from their journey. So as you go through the world, you can look at your hometown or anywhere from Pakistan to Mexico to Antarctica to the middle of the ocean, people riding across on planes. And it's, there are stories of people, their first kiss, uh, when they came out to their parents, when they were kicked out of their house, coming out to their parents. It builds uh, the use of data instead of something being used against queer people and minorities. It's something where data can be a tool of defining our identities, of creating community and acting as a historical database, a source of memory, an archive. I've also seen how data can be used in justice. Forensic Architecture are an agency based in London. They use phone data, they use films, they use internet data. And they combine it with architectural techniques to create war crimes and murders and bombings. And their work is aesthetically pleasing enough to be shown in galleries. But they're also using this in law courts. They're often in the Hague prosecuting war criminals. And even when the person causing these issues can't be found, data can still be a tool of bearing witness. The project Map of Femicide in Mexico is a project by Frida Guerrero, a Mexican activist, documenting every missing person, every missing woman in Mexico of the last 10 years. And it's a brutal project to look at this map that you're seeing, well, I'm still in front of, but that you're seeing, I feel like a weather person with this, um, and see how many missing people there are to realize the true scale of it. And data is able to testify to that, something that everyone in Mexico is aware of, but data is able to testify to that. And this project has been crucial in changing the discourse in Mexico on women's violence, violence against women. Data has also been used for speculative art. It's a project called Future Wake which I love very much. And, you know, before we were talking about how, about predictive policing, how police can use arrest data to keep arresting more of the people, more of the people who are like who they've been arresting before. This turns the logic of predictive policing on its head. It says, okay, instead of predicting where citizens are going to commit crimes, let's predict where police are going to commit crimes against citizens. And what it does is it uses data of police killings in the US to predict where the next killings are going to happen. And for each killing, it imagines a person with a name and how they look and what they do based on the data of previous killings. And by using data, this project is able to take an issue that we usually think of retrospectively after killings and project it into the future. These imagined people created through AIs, but who look similar to the people who have been killed and are likely to be killed. Instead of it being something retrospective, it's these people are currently alive in some way and we could stop it if we change the issue. So I started collecting these projects and I made a database of all of them. This is a collection of tactics, of case studies, of principles. And I started to realize there were all these connections between them. And I wanted to document it for other people so that when they come to this question, they can get an easy entrance into it. So I started publishing articles and my findings on Radical Data Org. And the, here we have articles theorizing on these groups and also just naming the groups, collecting them so that they're a reference for people who want to create their own projects. 
And while doing this, I start to realize, hey, as well as collecting, I want to be doing these things as well. There's important work that needs to be done. And seeing the connections between these projects, I start to realize what was important about making them work. So then the question that came up repeatedly is how do we do data for good? And what does this good mean? I think in the nonprofit sector as a whole, we can be a bit lazy with our definition of good. And we have this idea that we intrinsically just know what's good. But I think the reality is a lot more complicated. Even these good intentions and how we plan to use data don't work out that way. Even one of my favorite projects, Queering the Map, for example, even though I believe it's done amazing things for queer community and for pushing the possibilities of what's available with data, I think technically it falls on the wrong side of a lot of data privacy laws because you can't delete your data very easily. So the questions, even in these projects that are my gold standards, there's always these trade-offs. And I think the nonprofit sector can be a little lazy at times about some of these trade-offs. And in particular, this idea that we have an idea of what the good is. And through thinking and seeing these projects and creating my own, I start building a selection of guidelines that show me the way of how roughly to approach these things. And just for the sake of brevity, for right now, the most important one, I think, is the difference between making a project for someone versus making a project with someone. Making a project for a community versus making a project with that community. And you'll notice that all five of the projects I brought up before are all projects by the communities that are concerned with it. In Hong Kong, they're using lasers to protect themselves, to resist their own surveillance. And Maps of Femicide in Mexico, it was a Mexican woman who was trying to protect herself and others very like her and change the discourse on violence against women in Mexico. Querying the map, again, is made by a queer person. Um, Future Wake is made by a group of people who are most likely to be targeted. They're anonymous, but I know a few of them, and who are most likely to be targeted by police violence in the US. And Forensic Architecture, even though they're working across a lot of issues now, they started out looking at Israeli war crimes that were run by an Israeli director. And now when they work in Colombia, for example, they work very, very closely with organizations and data scientists and technologists. Crucially, the people running it, doing the data and the technology are based in these countries. So this is something that I tried to bring into all the radical data projects. And we've started making a few now under the banner of Radical Data Studio. The first project we ever made was called the Gratitude Machine. This was still at the stage when I was just collecting. I was speaking to a Chilean uh, critical theorist who's uh, indigenous Mapuche and we were talking about Mapuche ontology and epistemology and the way they look at the world. And we we're also reflecting on AI. At the time, this was two years ago, GPT-2 was still a big issue and it had been labeled the most dangerous tool in the world. And I was really interested in this. Like, you know, often we talk about how technology is neutral, but it never really is. It's always infused with a lot of ideas and makes certain use cases easier than others. So GPT-2 for me was the obvious target. Like how can we turn this thing that people saw as very dangerous in creating fake news? It's something that can create stories or text that looks very real, but it's just been written by a computer. 
we're wondering how can we take this from a dangerous thing and make it a tool of joy? How can we make something anti-capitalist from it? And we ended up coming up with this idea of the gratitude machine. And the reason we were interested in gratitude was two reasons. One is gratitude is a common tool in fighting depression. Uh, it's used in some therapies to alleviate depression by saying all the things you're thankful for. But the other one was a very political reason, and we felt like gratitude was this one thing that hadn't really been taken over by capitalism yet. You know, even sharing this super anti-capitalist thing that is something I associate much more now with Facebook and sharing ideas and posts. So Gratitude Machine is an AI you say thank you to it. Say thank you for the sun today. I hope you guys have all had sunny days. I have. And it trains the model, and the model learns how to be thankful a bit more than your help. And then it returns two thank yous back to you. It might say, thank you for my breakfast, and thank you for being able to give this talk today. So this is art created from a very different perspective. Another project is police unmasking. And this again came about through an interview my colleague Don, who's a writer of radical data, was interviewing Galicia Kwong, who's a very amazing Hong, uh, activist in Hong Kong. Um, and we were asking about how data had been used in these protests with lasers. And she mentioned that there was an activist there who'd created an AI that when the police uh, cracking down on process, protests, often they're taking off their badges so they can't be identified because they're engaging in something illegal. And one of the activists has created an AI that allowed them to re-identify the police. So to hold them accountable for crimes they were committing. And it was interesting when this came up because I realized actually that's something I've heard of before. And a few months ago, I'd heard about this Belarusian digital artists who've done the same thing in Belarus. So now in Radical Data, we realized, okay, there's no need for activists to be creating the same project over and over again and wasting that time to build it from scratch. So we're creating a template uh, that will can be used in police and masking to take a database of police photos and use AI to match pictures to that. And it will actually be our first closed source project. We've also started to be approached for our consulting work by communities and organizations who are interested in how they can use data in ways that are in line with certain political beliefs and infuse these beliefs into the technologies we're using. So one project we're involved in is called Security Vision, and it's a project funded by the European Research Council, uh, run by Leiden University. And we're mapping AI surveillance techniques um, across the world, how they're used to control borders in particular. But more crucially than all of this, I started to realize the central thing is how can we involve communities from the start? Not working with them, but just being able to share the tools we have so that we can actually completely step away as technologists and data scientists. So moving towards education. And this is something we've become very involved in. So this project here is a curated set of tools um, of tactics, case studies, principles called the Activist Guide to Data. And the idea is from looking through it, you can see how data has been used as a tool of resistance, as a tool of joy, as artistic tools in times, but centrally how it's been used for activism and how you can do it too. And the idea is activists can learn from uh, the research we've done radical data, but more crucially, the work that all these other community groups have done, we're learning from ourselves. 
We're also very involved in teaching this hands-on. So we started arranging a series of educational workshops. Uh, our first one will run next month for school children in the Netherlands. And we've got some others lined up in Switzerland. And I think this is the crucial switch that is necessary in the data for good world. Instead of projects being made for communities, it's something that is made with them. That's where I want to end it today. Um, thanks for listening. I, I'd like to open up a short discussion about these ideas, and in particular about more critical approaches to data for good and what this good means and how we can meaningfully share these tools with communities so that it's not so much on our own judgment of what is good, but for the communities to decide and create their own projects. So if anyone has any thoughts on that, I would love to hear them. I don't know if anyone's got a webcam that I can start seeing you. But feel free to share uh, thoughts and you can put, I think you can put your hand up as well if you've got a question. Oh, sorry, uh, Hans. Uh, Asa Anna, would you like to start us off? Sure, Joe. Hey, thank you so much for this uh, informative talk. This is You're doing amazing work and you're changing communities. Um, like no other so thank you so much this is, this enlightened me for sure i'm curious i'm an artist and i work in community um you know there's um always an interesting uh you know relationship gap or or you know how do you get communities involved especially with you know art is one thing i mean maybe there's a way into someone's interest in terms of community and art making but data is a little bit more complex the collection of data is so important to it. So how do you even begin to have those conversations with communities when you engage in them? Great question. I think it's, I will say it's also something we're learning ourselves as we do it. So um, this more project driven where we're actually creating the projects is something a bit newer to us. So I don't claim to have the answers, but what I've seen work with ourselves and other communities it's just about spending time with them. You know, these, I think sometimes these workshops assume that just taking a few hours teaching something, these communities are going to be able to go off and imagine these ideas, but that's not how it works. I think it really relies on, you know, data scientists, technologists spending time and time and time just understanding these communities and starting to push them in certain ways, but presenting tools that presenting tools that are accessible that they can learn from. So when I teach uh, environmental data visualization, for example, I start with just putting data on a Google Maps. You know, it's not that I love Google Maps, but it's about making, usually the important thing is the idea and people know what data could be useful to start to see, you know? Like if you're working in homelessness, you can start documenting homeless centers and support for that or anything like that. And that stuff's very easy to get started with and it's kind of just offering a graded introduction to this. So maybe you first put on some data on Google Maps and then you start building your own thing, your own specific platform like querying the map or something like that. But mm -hmm. for sure, it's not, it's something we're very interested in exploring more and um, it's top of my list of things we're wondering about. So it's a great question. Thanks, Joe. Thanks. Matt, would you like to share a question, Matt? Hi there. Uh, thanks very much for the talk. It was very interesting. Um, I was wondering, you know, as someone who's maybe earlier on in their career has more of a traditional data science background, but hasn't thought about these kinds of problems from um, maybe a more critical lens, what would be your advice to that person? Um, and how can they get involved in radical data and adopt these kinds of radical data philosophies in their career as they go forward? 
That's also a great question. Um, the easy part is the second part, and that's that we we work as a collective and we're very open to new members. And whether that's as a data scientist like yourself, or as an artist, a writer, designer, lawyers, whatever, we're really open to learn from all these different perspectives. So if you're interested in this, in any of those capacities, I'd love it if you reached out to me or Radical Data and we could start discussing ways we could do things together. The, the other one's just also interesting, and I think probably longer term, it's I want to create these guides for different communities of people. So maybe I'm working on this activist guide at the moment, which I feel is the most uh, time sensitive that I want to get done first. I think maybe second, I want to create a curated list of these kinds of ideas. I mean, there's an uncurated set of this, which is the Radical Data website and our workshops and things like that. And I think engaging with that starts to open up some of these questions. But now you say it, I think it'd be really interesting to put together some guide to data scientists. For, for me, I see Radical Data as kind of between these two worlds. On one side, there's like acting radical, uh, acting data scientists and technologists, and on the other, artists and critical theorists and academics. And for me, it's about bridging those gaps. And at the moment, I'm doing a bit more on helping activists bridge over this gap. And I'd love to do more in the future on data scientists coming across this way as well. Awesome. Thanks very much. Thanks. Is there anyone else who'd like to ask anything? Joe, this is Daniel. Hey, Daniel. How are you doing? Thanks Good. so much. Uh, intriguing, intriguing talk for sure. Hey, early on in your slide deck, uh, it looked like you had uh, a graphic that had mapped out a number of these different kinds of approaches. Um, I'm not 100% sure I'm getting that right, but yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, is this something that is publicly available? I am going to make, I'm currently redoing the website so that my, my idea is that at the moment I do a lot of the research and it feels like my personal research, but what I want to do is make it public so that everyone going to the website feels like in this position of a researcher. Sure. So I'm currently redoing the website so that this is a central part of it. So yeah. that'll That'd be, be next month when I'm doing that. I think it would be tremendously valuable to be able to, you know, and part of the trick for folks, I'm a community development guy, um, you know, rhetorician by training, and I'm always sort of stepping into new intellectual terrain. So uh, never, rarely do I, you know, have a community of practice around me when I start doing something new. And so being able to wade through the complex, you know, eternal amount of data that exists online and have a curated account of, you know, this headspace from somebody who really, you know, thinks and works in this domain would be super helpful, uh, you know, just to, 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 you know, pique curiosity, give us ideas, you know, those sorts of things. So keep at it, and uh, I would love to see it when it comes out. That's really good to hear, and a good motivation for me, uh, packing through the horrible HTML and stuff I've got to do to make uh, it even it's I mean, different. I understand why you want to go there, but even something as simple as, you know, a spreadsheet format that just had, you know, lists and links. I mean, uh, I'd sift through yeah. that for hours and just kind of, you know, uh, okay. super valuable. Okay, that's great to know. Yeah, I guess uh, sometimes technologists have a way of overcomplicating these things. Hey, well, you got to make it pretty. Well, that's I guess, really good. Huh? Thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah. I, uh, also, this is open to everyone. If you share your data with Radical Data on the main website, we have a mailing list. And if you sign up to that, I'll be able to add, I'll, I'll share when this uh, database is accessible for everyone. I think hey, that's a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I, I thought this site was live, so it's, I'm glad to hear that it, is, that, that it will be soon. Who was the Mexican artist that you referenced? Um, Frida Guerrero. Yeah. It's like a, it's more like a battle name. <laughs> it's not uh, her real name, but uh, oh, okay. you'll be able to find it. But there's actually not that much written in English on her. But this is the website. 
It's called Bearing Witness. It is called Bearing Witness. No, it's or? called Mapper Feminist. Is that, a, can you see this on my? Oh, okay, there it is. I couldn't see it before. Thank you. Share it, yeah. Yeah, I, I really want, as far as I know, there's not a English language article on that project. So I'm really keen to speak to a student and write that. One thing I forgot to mention is that we're really keen on decentralizing the work we do at Radical Data. I think there's a bit of a habit for nonprofits and particularly like data and tech ones to be based in Europe and North America. And we're keen to, as early as possible, be driven by researchers and artists in Latin America and Africa. And we're making the most headway. We've got someone dedicated to Latin America right now. So that's a big interest of ours. And we started presenting talks in Spanish and doing interviews in Spanish as well. So something that I want to share. Thanks. So anyone? else with a question or some thoughts or anything before we finish up? Okay, I'm going to take that as the end. Um, thanks so much for coming along today. It's, it's really interesting for me, for me to share these ideas in a slightly different context in this data for good area which I feel is so much in common with what we're trying to do with radical data and there's a lot to, of mutual learning there I think. Like I say if any of you want to get involved with the work we're doing at radical data please get in touch. Um, you can write to me at joe at radicaldata.org or use the mailing list or however else you want to. Also my website is here with my Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn and whatever you like there but Thanks so much for coming along today and um, hope to see you again some other time.